Hi, my name is Connor Delaney. I'd like to welcome everybody to another episode of MD Insight here at Cleveland Clinic. And um, today I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Mike Klein, uh, who's going to talk with us this morning. Um, Dr. Klein is a gastroenterologist here at the clinic, and he has a particular interest in gastroparesis. Hi, Mike. Welcome this morning. Well, thank you. I appreciate the invite. It's, this is fun to do. <laughs> Yeah, delighted to have you here. So listen, it's something that obviously we see a lot of, but a lot of people don't. And it, it might just be good to start off by telling everybody, what is gastroparesis? So gastroparesis, by definition, gastro means stomach, and paresis means paralyzed or slow. Um, what's interesting about gastroparesis is it's probably, well, we know it's very underdiagnosed. Um, and the last study done nationwide estimated that in a diabetic population, there were probably one to one and a half million people who have it and don't know it, uh, which is scary. Um, it's becoming more commonly diagnosed as doctors become more aware of it. Um, and unfortunately also, there are very few centers across the country who treat it as a specialty and, and we, we can get into that. But by definition, it's basically a stomach that doesn't move or empty well, that's all. So thinking of the patient and their perspective then, what are, what are the symptoms that a patient is going to have from this? You know, maybe mild and maybe what's the more severe end? And right. How, how do we let them know what they should be looking for or, or it's rare enough or underdiagnosed enough that what they should be reminding their physicians to look for? So it can range from mild nausea to, to fullness after eating that does not go away. Uh, they're unable to finish a normal-sized meal, something they used to be able to do and now aren't able to do. Um, not even depending on what kind of food it is, just not able to eat. They take a few bites and feel like they've eaten a whole meal. Uh, clear to severe weight loss and malnutrition and the inability to take anything and even liquids. One category, though, that I wanted to highlight uh, is something that uh, is interesting. There was a study done decades ago looking at acid reflux. And patients who have uncontrolled acid reflux on high dose medicine, about 40% of the time will actually have gastroparesis as a cause of severe acid reflux. So it's something that, I mean, millions of people take medicine every day for acid reflux, but we don't think of gastroparesis as the source. Right. Um, the other concern is a lot of times this occurs in young women. We're not sure why, although we believe now a lot of that is autoimmune. Um, and in those ladies and those young women, um, they can have other symptoms, joint symptoms, muscle pains. So if, you've been, if they've been diagnosed with an autoimmune disorder of some sort and they're having stomach issues, this should be the diagnosis that they look into. Okay, so we've got autoimmune gastroparesis, we've got diabetic gastroparesis. Any other causes or any other major things people might want to think of? Um, if they've had surgery on their stomach, for example, a hiatal hernia repair, a Nissen fundoplication, uh, upwards of somewhere between 8 to 10% of those patients may end up with gastroparesis, anywhere from immediate to 10 years later. Um, if you had surgery for ulcer disease or um, one other category that we have seen rarely, but it does occur, is in the cardiology world. Uh, if they do an ablation for an aberrant pathway, if it's on the backside of the heart, the energy can leak out and actually hit the nerve that tells the stomach what to do. Right, and so when we used to do ulcer operations years ago, we do a, a vagotomy and a pyloroplasty to Correct. Have gastric Correct. drainage for that reason. So for that reason. in the vagus nerve, it's, it's a problem. So, so that's what it is, and that's what the symptoms are. So next steps are, you know, somebody comes to you with, uh, with these symptoms and you think they may be a candidate who has gastroparesis. What, what's your pathway for evaluation? Um, one of the, so the first step, kind of the gold standard still, which I we believe probably should change, but the gold standard right now is, this, is the nuclear medicine gastric emptying test, which is essentially toast, scrambled eggs, and either milk or water, um, labeled with a tracer that they can see on a camera. The issue there is that they really need to be a four hour test, and a lot of centers don't do that. They do two hours or even 90 minutes, and we now know that the 90 minute test is pretty much useless, so a lot of patients get diagnosed with gastroparesis on a bad test and may or may not have it. And that's a problem because then you're working the wrong diagnosis or they get underdiagnosed. They're told, oh, your 90 minute test is normal. And in reality, it could be real gastroparesis. So one of the first things I do is we look at what test did they have? Was it done right? And then we look at other symptoms that they have. Do they have more total gut symptoms? Are they severely constipated? 
Do they have bloating? Other symptoms that are below the stomach. So we do that kind of full gut evaluation. And then we really dive into, and this is kind of where the specialty clinics come in and why I think this really deserves to be a specialty clinic across the country yeah. is we dive into the autoimmune realm with a lot of blood work and we look at all the other medical causes, thyroid, diabetes, uh, muscle disorders, all kinds of things, as well as going towards the total gut motility worker. Um, and to do that, typically we use here at Cleveland Clinic a test called Smart Pill or wireless motility capsule. It measures movement all the way through the gut. There are some other centers that do extended gastric emptings essentially where they give them higher doses of the, the um, label and food and watch it for many, many hours, 24 hours essentially going through the entire gut. Now you've particular experience with the smart pill. You've huge experience with the smart pill. Right. Um, so it's, it's really transformed the way we assess this, I think, based on, on all of the data you've put together. Yes. And, and it has, well, we published an article two years ago in diabetics uh, that showed uh, well over 60 to 65% of the time that pill changed how we would have managed the patient, which is huge. Uh, I, do have, I do have some exciting news. We'll launch it here on MD Insights. Um, I, was, I was given a gift from a patient uh, and we are going to be ordering it here in the next week. There is a new machine that we are getting, which will even aid further in the diagnosis. It's called electrogastrography, EGG machine. Uh, we'll uh, be using that in conjunction with all the other testing to look at the actual electric, electrical activity of the stomach. This device does it. It's non-invasive, works like an EKG machine, essentially, uh, and can measure the electrical activity of the entire stomach. Yeah, I just signed the order for it this week. It's going to be coming soon. So, yeah. you know, we're excited not... actually. And it was very, on I was very honored to have the patient give the gift to us to do that. So, it's incredibly generous. And it's, it's really this partnership in healthcare between physicians, patients, and generous donors that can allow us to do these new exploratory things. So, yep. so moving on then from that, Mike, so you've got all the data, you come up with the different types. So what are the, some of the treatments that, that become the, the most frequent treatments or the most common treatments that people might want to hear about? So typically by the time the patient gets to me, if they've gone to someone that has made the diagnosis, and sometimes they do something, mean, sometimes they come in having treated, and, and that's one thing I did want to say about our clinic is you don't have to have treatment to get to the clinic. If you get the diagnosis, even if you've never tried a medication, we'll still evaluate the patient and see the patient and figure out what they need. But typically the patients at least tried metoclopramide, of the old drug. Uh, that is not a fun drug. It's not a very safe drug. Uh, and is, is actually the only FDA approved drug right now for gastroparesis, which is a little scary. It has lots of side effect potential. Um, typically then we move on to a drug like erythromycin. Uh, so erythromycin chemically is identical to a compound that makes everybody's stomachs empty and it gets away without the side effects of Reglan. Obviously it is an antibiotic with those potential issues, but at least it helps with symptoms. And then the, a lot of it is treatment of other, just symptom control, nausea, uh, pain control. If we have to, we don't use pain medicine, obviously, because those would slow the stomach down, but other medicines to modulate pain. And then we move very quickly into, and, and this is interesting because I'm a, a non-surgeon, <laughs> But we move into the surgical realm, unfortunately, because we don't have good medicines available for gastroparesis. Um, and we, we get into the, the surgical realm. Now, fortunately, here at the clinic, uh, I work with some very amazing surgeons. And um, we have perfected a technique, uh, which we have coined the term POP, P-O-P, stands for peroral pyloromyotomy, meaning we do an endoscopy, which almost all of these patients have had multiple scopes. So they understand that. Um, and we can open the pyloric muscle from inside the stomach now instead of doing a full-out surgery like we had to before. Uh, we've done over 500 of these now easily, and we're, we're getting excellent results. And I think we're getting excellent results because we do the full workup before we do that. We try to do the complete workup before we send somebody for any procedure. Uh, but that's really become our gold standard here because of it being so non-invasive and it's working. Um, if that doesn't work, we then tend to go to the more aggressive surgeries, uh, as well as pacemakers. Um, pacemakers are a good option in some patients. The problem is that if it works best in a well-controlled diabetic with mild gastroparesis, uh, we don't know why the diabetics respond better than anybody else. But in everyone else, statistically, you're talking about a 50-50 shot 
whether it's going to help you as a pacemaker. So, and it's very invasive, obviously. Um, and uh, so a lot of times patients get referred to us for four pacemakers, and then we talk them out of that into other things before we go down that road. Uh, that's a, a great review of the options. And, and then for patients who might realize this POP procedure or pyloromyotomy, at the outlet of the stomach, there's this constricting band, the pylorus of muscle, which allows food to stay in the stomach. And, and it's non-relaxation is sometimes problematic. So literally from inside the stomach with a scope, we can divide those muscle fibers and release it and allow the stomach empty. And that's been transformative, hasn't it, Mike, for many patients? It really has. We, we are in the, in the area of 60 to 65% uh, getting the gastric emptying back to normal, uh, completely back to normal, meaning when we repeat the gastric emptying test, it's no longer delayed at all, yeah, which yeah. is one of the first things we've ever seen that's, do, that's doing this. Yeah, yeah, and it's incisionless. Yes, uh, yeah. Really patient goes, I mean, patients, some of them go home same day. Typically, they're staying overnight and being discharged the following morning. Right, and they get an x-ray to make sure that everything's... Right. Yep. looking good and, and then they go home. Tell me, you mentioned as well the, the more whole gut motility, which obviously can be can be very challenging. There's no point in fixing the stomach if the rest of the gut isn't working. Correct. And so maybe tell people a little about the, the more pan-intestinal motility and uh, what your thoughts are around that. Mm -hmm. So that is the, I think the key workup is figuring out is the whole gut involved or not, especially in the diabetic realm or in patients who have other neurologic issues, because a lot of times it's not just the stomach. And so that, you're right, it, it's kind of common sense if it's the entire intestine, why work on one part? When it becomes the whole intestine, that takes us out of the surgical realm, more into the medical realm. And we kind of have to treat each section almost separately, the stomach versus the colon, for example, the small intestine kind of responds with the colon. Um, but here at the clinic, we are, we are on the, the two national panels for the motility drugs that treat the entire gut. Um, Domperidone, which every, a lot of patients know about from Canada, uh, is still available um, through an FDA restriction, but we, have, we are on the panel to write for that. Uh, but more importantly, we're on the panel for a drug called Cisapride or Propulsive, which was a very old drug, uh, which is now back out on compassionate use. Uh, we're one of the very few sites across the country. I think there's, I don't, I'm not even sure how many, maybe 15 sites across the country now, maybe less, um, who are allowed to write for that. The benefit of that is it is one of the only drugs we've ever had that is total gut motility. Um, has some very serious restrictions that we have to follow. Um, but right now we have about 110 patients on Cisapride as a motility drug. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's uh, another option. It used to be a great drug and with the right indications, it, it can still have a use, I think. Yes. Um, and then you mentioned as well the partnership between surgeons and gastroenterologists. And I, I think that's how you've been able to build and you're to be commended for all the effort you've put in. But uh, this, <laughs> this specialized center, and it's been fantastic. It's really transformed uh, what we can offer patients. We try to do it, you know, we try to make it as, and it actually COVID with the, with the virtual visits has made it a little more difficult, but, but uh, typically as everything else, but typically when the patient comes to our clinic, they will see my, you know, they'll see me uh, we will have an appointment right after my appointment with the surgery team. So the surgeon will walk in and see them. My nurse coordinator, who they've dealt with on the phone, will talk to them. Uh, we have both um, video as well as live face-to-face -face visits with dietitians when needed. Um, so it really has become kind of a multidisciplinary, uh, uh, multi-specialty approach. Uh, and we hope to continue to build that and get other specialties involved. Yeah, truly. And I, I think all of this scaling of virtual visits and video visits like this video conference is really allowing us to get your specialized care to patients who, you know, can't immediately come to us geographically. So it's been great. It, so, you know, it really has. It has opened up. It has opened up our clinic. In fact, uh, my surgeon and I were talking about whether we should just continue a virtual gastroparesis clinic uh, yeah. where we see people across the country so they don't have to travel until it's time to treat them. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So tell me, um, obviously we also have the surgical gut rehab team and we've got a pelvic floor motility team because these motility issues can be diff affecting different parts of the GI tract um, or the whole GI tract, as you mentioned. Um, what about transplantation for exceptional cases? Is there the odd case that, that will be helped by transplantation or does it ever get to that in your experience? 
Yes, fortunate, fortunately, obviously, we don't want to go there unless we have right. to, because it's obviously very dramatic, but it does work uh, in patients who have severe total gut dysmotility, where nothing has worked. We've run the gamut of all the medicines, even tried some surgeries, you know, taking out the colon or creating an ileostomy where the small intestine comes out or opening the stomach completely. When those surgeries have failed, then we move towards the total gut transplantation idea. Um, and fortunately, we are blessed to have a very a phenomenal team, I'll say, in, in the gut rehab group. Uh, they work very, very closely with us as well as the patients. And, and the nice part there is, too, we share the patient. The patient still comes back and sees my team as well as seeing them. So the patient is, is kept in the loop as, as well as all the doctors. Yeah, it's a, it's a great partnership, truly. Yeah, the GI transplant team are wonderful. So, Mike, in closing, we've covered a huge amount, but are there any other things coming down the pike, research options, other things that would be uh, worth mentioning to people for their radar screens? Uh, um, have we covered the gamut? No, I th that's pretty well, although we do have a uh, COVID put this on hold also. We are going to be a part of a nationwide study on a new drug for gastroparesis. Uh, it has not opened back up yet for enrollment. Uh, they closed it down as COVID hit. Uh, I think it's going to be open probably by the end of July or 1st of August is what they're expecting. Okay. Um, but it will be a novel drug in its own category for diabetic as well as non-diabetic gastroparesis. We're excited. Uh, we were selected as one of the sites across the country um, to do this study with, uh, with the drug company. So uh, we're excited to get that rolling. We we're hoping to get it rolling three months ago, but it'll, it'll come. Um, and it's, it's a great advance because it's the first drug kind of in its own category that's being looked at. All these other drugs are, are related to each other. And this is a new direction, which I think is exciting. Uh, we're finally getting some research into other areas of gastroparesis. Yeah, well, people can reach out and find out more about it. It's exciting the different options that you're able to bring people. Well, um, Mike Fine, thank you very much. Really appreciate you being here on MB Insight and educating us on gastroparesis. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the time.